over the last couple of decades, we've had a million-fold decrease in the cost of sequencing DNA, a thousand-fold in synthesis. We have gene editing tools like CRISPR, massive uh, parallel experiments through multiplex techniques that have come about. And of, of course, much of this work has been um, led by your lab. Despite all of this, why is it the case that we don't have some huge industrial revolution, some huge burst of new drugs, or some uh, cures for Alzheimer's and cancer that have already come about? When you look at other trends in other fields, right? Like we have Moore's Law and here's my iPhone. Uh, why don't we have something like that in biology yet? Yes, so we have something that's about the same speed, a little bit faster than Moore's Law in biology. It's more recent is one aspect of it. So we had, but we had, we could kind of stand on the shoulders of the electronics giants to, to go a little bit faster to catch up. Um, I, I would say we do. I mean, we have the biotech industry, which uh, has used that uh, exponential curve to to get better. It's also possible we're close to the big payoff as uh, mm -hmm. the other aspect or the beginning of the big payoff. Um, you know, right now we have miraculous things like um, cures for rare diseases. We have vaccines for, uh, we have, you know, uh, you know, you know, trillion dollars probably of, of various biotech related things if you go far enough apart. Uh, but, uh, but, but we're kind of on the verge of really um, combining electronics and biology more thoroughly and AI and biotech. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, I, it seems like we're on the same track as, as Moore's Law, if not better. Mm. What, what, what exactly are we on the verge of? What, what does 2040 look like? Well, 2040, we're talking about only 15 years, uh, which is... You know, like one and a half, you know, maybe two cycles of FDA approval. Um, 2040 is post-AGI. <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> well, I hope it's not post-AGI. I, 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 I think we're rushing a little bit to get to AGI, and there's lots of cool things we can do with just mm -hmm. super AI. Uh, but we need to be very cautious, I think, that, that AGI... Well, anyway, we could, we could get into I, that. I have questions but, for you there. But, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think that we were we are shortening the 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 time of getting medical products approved, uh, in a, in a, still in a safe way. Uh, so I think, but that's not going to completely change the the exponential. It will you know might re reduce it from ten years down to one year is our record so far for say uh, COVID vaccines. Um, so maybe that'll be ten times shorter. Maybe that that will multiply out a little bit. Uh, but I think the big thing is that all our, our designs will become better, so there'll be fewer, fewer failures. The cost per, per drug will, will, will drop. There'll be things that we didn't classically consider drugs or instruments, um, be kind of sort, some sort of hybrid thing. But again, I don't think that'll be completely shocking. But but it just it's just going to be so much of it. You know, it's just it's going to be lots of diversity of of solutions. How much more are we talking? Is it, are we gonna have 10x the amount of drugs, 100x? I'm not even sure it's gonna make sense, but that, yeah, 100x would not be completely surprising. Um, combinations of drugs will be important. You're using them intelligently, there'll be a lot, lot more. Um, some some drugs will affect everything. So for example, an age-related drug that could right. that could impact every disease. And it could, um, so, so it's gonna be, uh, I'm not sure the number is going to matter so much as the the quality and the impact and inter intersection and 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 uh, and software that helps uh, physicians and and other and regular citizens make decisions. Mm. Yeah. And, and what specifically is changing that's enabling this? Is it just existing cost curves continuing, or is it some new technique or tool that will come about? Well, the 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 cost curves are affected by new tools. I mean, it's it's not just some automatic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a a big dis discontinuity between um, Sanger sequencing and nanopores and fluorescent next gen sequencing. That was, and so, you know, I think uh, sometimes it's a merger of two things. So cl clearly, AI merging with protein design caused a step function. 
these step functions get smoothed out into a kind of a smooth exponential, but there, there, there are lots of them. Uh, next, the next set will probably be, yeah, a merger of AI with other aspects of biology, like developmental biology, uh, merger of developmental biology with, with uh, you know, manufacturing and, uh, you know, you, conquering developmental biology, in other words, actually knowing how to make any arbitrary shape given, um, you know, DNA as the as the mm -hmm. programming material, uh, I think that would be a big thing. Uh, having just more materials in general, all the materials that we use in mechanical and electrical engineering should be uh, made better by uh, biotechnologies. Why? Why is that? Uh, why is that? Well, it's uh, that electronics is you know Moore's law. I wouldn't say is stopping, but it's it's kind of the the what we would call the one nanometer yeah. um, process, which is supposed to come out in 2027 according to the roadmap, is not really one nanometer. It's more like 40 nanometers center to center spacing. Right. You know, of, uh, in the in typically in two dimensions, um, maybe a little bit of three dimensions. But but biology is already at 0.4 nanometer resolution, and it is in three dimensions, and so. You know, depending on how you count that third dimension, that that could be a billion times mm -hmm. higher density that biology is already at. Um, and uh, you know, we just need a little more practice with dealing with the whole periodic table. Mm. Uh, even lecture, lectural engineering and mechanical doesn't use the whole periodic table typically, but we but especially not at the atomic level. So that's, I think biology is just really good at doing atomic precision. So then what's the reason that over the last many decades, and we have, we do have um, not atomic, but close to atomic level manufacturing with semiconductors. 40 nanometers. Right. It's quite small. <laughs> it's a thousand times bigger than biology, linearly. But the, the progress we have made hasn't been related to biology so far. It seems like the, the we've, we've made Moore's Law happen um, I don't know, people in the 90s were saying, you know, ultimately we'll have these bio machines that are uh, doing the computing. But it seems like we've just been using conventional uh, manufacturing processes. So what exactly is it that changes that allows us to use bio to make these things? So a few things. One is the, the arrival of synthetic biology, um, mm -hmm. and where, you're, where you sort of, we were already kind of doing synthetic biology before, you know, we were doing recombinant DNA was kind mm -hmm. of, you know, genetic engineering was called was kind of in that direction, but synthetic biology really liberated us to think um, a little bit bigger, um, even though it started kind of focused on E. coli and yeast, it, 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 it enabled us to th maybe think uh, about new amino acids, for example. And I think new amino acids, if you start using the full periodic table with the amino acids or what the amino acids can catalyze, um, that that breaks one of the major barriers. One of the major barriers between, you know, electrical and mechanical engineering and biology was, was the use of, you know, s special materials, say, things that conduct electricity at the speed of light or conduct signals more, yeah. more generally. Um, but there's, there's, absolute, there's definitely polymers uh, that biology can make that will conduct at the speed of light. Um, and, uh, you know, we could make uh, a mixed neuronal system that has conventional neurons and uh, processes that conduct at the speed of light. That would be interesting. Um, and so, so I, th I think that uh, our ability to design uh, proteins was particularly difficult. Designing nucleic acids was great, whether we were doing, you know, you, you, you want two things to, to bind to each other, yeah. you just dial it up using Watson-Crick rules. If you want to make a three-dimensional structure, you know, it's actually the one, kind of the one thing where morphology is dictated by fairly simple rules. It's not how developmental biology works, and we still need to figure out how that works, but uh, DNA origami, DNA nanostructures really work. But doing it for proteins was really, really hard until, I don't know, um, maybe eight years ago, something like mm -hmm. that. And, and I think we're f just now getting used to it. The use of chips for making DNA. Um, I mean, you said that the DNA synthesis come down a thousand fold. Well, it depends on who you talk to. So that when we came out with uh, the first chip 
based genes in 2004 Nature paper, uh, you know, basically people dismissed it for about a decade. The only people that used it were, you know, collaborators and, and alumni, um, and it wasn't even listed on the Moore's law curve for for DNA mm -hmm. synthesis, even though it was like a thousand times cheaper. It was just like ignored, and uh, and now we have claims of ten to the seventeenth genes, okay, that you can make, you yeah. make libraries 10 to 17th that aren't randomized in any, in any real, in the usual sense where you just like do error-prone PCR or spiked in nucleotides. Uh, now 10 to 17th, that's a lot bigger than a thousand fold, you know, if, if, you know, if it turns out to be practical, yeah. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.